now what I'll be doing is talking about the presentation that was given on the 25th and 26th of November 2018 uh, at the International Symposium on Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, uh, which was put on by the National Centre for Neurological and Emerging Diseases at Griffith University. And I wish to thank uh, Professors Donald Staines and Sonia Gl um, Gladasnik uh, for welcoming me uh, to the podium uh, to present my work uh, on the therapy and the treatment of chronic fatigue syndrome using um, particular biomarkers developed by St Jude's Clinic. Firstly, we need to understand that the opportunity to gauge success um, is extremely important because without detecting success, uh, all theories are rendered uh, just that, just as theory. Uh, we do need results and results that can be trusted and relied upon uh, both by the patients and also by observers uh, for people uh, to be able to detect whether a significant change in the management and treatment of chronic fatigue syndrome has actually taken place. So I'll now present to you uh, customised daily recordings using patient-centred outcomes in unexplained illnesses as biomarkers for chronic fatigue syndrome and ME, myalgic encephalomyelitis. This is basically a cause and effect model uh, that affects the function of an individual. And whilst visual, we're all attuned to seeing visual changes in pathological tests or physically to be able to gauge success, chronic fatigue syndrome ME is one of those very difficult conditions where you can't actually detect with the eyes a um, visual response to treatment because there are no markers, biomarkers, for um, determining the e efficacy of treatment. So what do we do in this situation where there are no biomarkers and yet we do need to gauge the efficacy of treatment from an accountability perspective and also for the patient's um, uh, satisfaction to be able to see whether they are actually improving. So before we move into the biomarker, the presenta presentation focused on a new method that was devised at St. Jude's that looked at the person as a whole system. Rather than um, uh, focusing on whether there were particular enzymes that were missing or nutrients that were missing or uh, calcium influx into a cell that uh, was not properly regulated. And, um, the biosystems or biohealthcare model looked at a whole systems approach, which is basically talking about how one part of the body is connected to another part of the body. And given that connectedness, it's, um, yeah, it's a possible mechanism of explanation to say that the diversity of symptoms um, um, can be many and varied simply because of the multiple systems that are involved. So the big idea is that, is that if we could turn on the body and the body itself actually had the potential to be switched on, it would generate healing given this interconnectedness across multiple systems of the body. Not just in one area of the body, but because of that connection or relationship that we would see uh, symptomatic improvements across the entire system of the body. Now that actually is going to be dependent upon the number of connections uh, that we are uh, working on um, in one particular area. So if one particular area of the body had very few connections, it's unlikely that the symptoms would be broad and many. But if we were working on a primary area of the body, that actually had multiple connections to multiple areas and it in itself played a very strong role in regulating those particular areas of the body that it was connected to, then we are likely to see both a more rapid recovery, more diverse responses to the treatment that's being given as well, and a demonstration of the relationship that this particular part plays with other areas of the body as well. 
So the, the big question now becomes where and when does my body come under my conscious control and yet is inextricably connected to influential areas that are supposedly beyond my control? And that's a very fundamental question as to well, where on earth do we work to be able to make an impact in the person's health and to be able to bring them back to health? Where do we find this area of what comes under our conscious control and has an impact on areas that control autonomic function? So we understand that um, by the nature of chronic fatigue ME, that there is autonomic nervous system dysregulation. How are we meant to control this dysregulation through conscious control, an area, um, an area that we control that can actually influence areas that are supposedly beyond our control? Now, if we find that particular area um, and we use this particular paradigm to be able to think of health not just as a compartmentalised or reductionist sort of approach where we can take a particular pill to help um, a particular physiological process, but we actually look beyond that medicative or medication um, approach and we can actually see that there are actually areas in our body itself which can impact on a cellular level uh, changes that can be actually recorded in a visual capacity because of cellular's influence and connectedness to the physical symptoms that we experience. Now more questions are going to then arise as to how on earth we can demonstrate this, this particular reduction um, of a person's uh, symptoms and what we need to do is we actually, well, how can we actually visualize simultaneous and dramatic symptom reductions across multiple systems? How can we actually detect the early signs of success? And how can we distinguish between these early signs of success or genuine improvements and also the natural ebb and flow or natural history of remissions, which sometimes shows improvement and then otherwise um, goes into um, deterioration again? We want to be able to also establish a link between um, chronic fatigue syndrome ME and other comorbidities. So this becomes a real concern um, if we're going to be looking at particular um, symptoms and ignoring other symptoms in a person. And the person may be no, not interested at all if their prostaglandins appear normalised, um, yet their menstrual cycle is up the spout and are highly dysregulated with either long intervals or amenorrhea, meaning no bleeding, or um, polymenorrhea uh, with, multi, uh, with uh, very heavy bleeding and um, uh, obvious pain associated with the, the menstrual cycle as well. But if we then incorporate things like gastric motility as well and constipation or diarrhea issues or reflux, heartburn and indigestion uh, concerns or intolerance to certain food groups or sensitivities to certain food groups as well. We want to be able to consider the entirety of the person um, and, and uh, consider then how we can actually influence both the fatigue states, the pain registration, the gastric motility, the mood panic disorders or uh, palpitations uh, we also want to be able to look at immune responses as well and somehow graph all of these things simultaneously and in a timely manner um, so that we can actually detect in a sensitive fashion early signs of change. Furthermore, are we able to, using this particular paradigm of turning on the body or flicking on a switch and seeing all of these symptoms improve, are we able to predict time frames for those people that do recover and those people that may not be um, in the position where recovery is um, possible either? So can we actually show who likely responders are? So using a, an Excel spreadsheet which is conditionally formatted, we're able to now then generate uh, a sense of symptomatic um, um, diary entries which are quite customised and speak meaningfully into a person's 
uh, disability. And there, there may actually be um, uh, lots of uh, symptoms that can be included in, in this particular uh, presentation as well, and we need to actually colour code those uh, symptoms without making them too overbearing as well. And what I'll do now is I'll actually go through and take a look at some of my Excel spreadsheets which can be found on the St Jude's Clinic website. And if you go to the St Jude's Clinic website, you'll be able to see uh, some of those symptomatic improvements occurring in real time so that we can demonstrate both in a time frame the manner of recovery, how fast that is occurring in people across the multiple disciplines or systems um, that um, chronic fatigue patients or ME patients would actually be um, used to seeing, those practitioners that they would be used to seeing to manage the, the number of symptoms that they experience simultaneously. So if we then go ahead and take a look at some of those symptoms as well in people, we might be able to take a look at um, people like uh, Patrick C on the website um, who has sleep quality issues and um, he started his care in December 13. Um, he also has naturally very low levels of energy, interrupted sleep at night, fatigue at the end of the day, no inclination to socialise, his bed um, is in a state of disarray, he has sweating at night, he takes antidepressants and sedatives to be able to regulate his mood and also his sleep energy cycle. He has um, significant spinal pain. He has headaches of three times per week. His mood is low. Uh, he is an impatient type fellow and his clothes feel tight, which causes also further frustration as well. Taking a look at his spreadsheet on the website, you'll be able to then see that there are uh, remarkable changes occurring within a fortnight and then if we continue on from December 13 past December 29 we'll be able to see that um, he's now dropped his medication from December 27 from 450 milligrams to 300 milligrams. Now that was actually done at the patient's um, decision uh, without consulting uh, the practitioner and we wouldn't advise that you just simply go off your medications like that but during this um, time of year at Christmas and also um, New Year's, um, he decided that he was actually feeling uh, better, better enough to be able to see that he could drop his um, evening medications. He then continued through from December 27 to January uh, 27 and he was still taking no PM medications yet his sleep quality has improved significantly now into the green phase his energy levels also into the green phase and this is one month after care if we continued on uh, from January 7, 27 to February 27 we'll actually see that his spreadsheet is looking more green now than red uh, indicating that recovery is well underway and that's two months after starting care March 27 there's still a significant amount of fatigue at the end of the day, interruptions to sleep, but it's um, sort of embedded in a sea of green. And um, the, the influence of that is, is that our patient is growing more and more confident as to what's taking place. Now, um, as you go through the spreadsheet, you'll actually see that um, coming up through till about um, April 14, um, the spreadsheet takes a significant colour change where most of it now becomes green and um, within five months and um, probably around about uh, 15 sessions uh, Patrick has now uh, considerably improved. That improvement has stayed the same all the way throughout the year right through until December uh, and now into early January he has made a remarkable recovery um, having suffered with chronic fatigue uh, syndrome, ME syndrome, uh, for many years. Um, his medication has also dropped as you go through the graph and you'll be able to see that multiple symptom improvements have now been visualised in a spreadsheet and that actually takes us through um, to the um, next aspect of the presentation and that is what effect does that actually have on a, a a client as well. And the fact that a, a person can actually feel um, confident in their recovery is paramount because 
um, people who have suffered for so long don't actually believe that recovery is possible. And the assurance of seeing, visually seeing that the spreadsheet itself is, um, has made a significant change um, is profound. The fact that the spreadsheet can be shared with people um, also allows um, a, a somewhat halving of the burden as well because uh, patients are now able to describe that um, what they are actually experiencing because it's customised, it's very personal to them and if we're able to uh, generate a sense of um, taking on that burden, being empathic with the patient as well to be able to support them in this journey towards recovery, having already established what goals uh, what goals and success would look like, then we can actually move in this journey together because success doesn't happen overnight, but it can happen quickly. And the reason why it is happening quickly is because this is a type of patient-centered health care which doesn't really focus on taking something for your particular disease, but it actually focuses on what you can do to help yourself in a strategized and systemized way that says th we're doing this particular action or we're changing this particular habit for the purposes of trying to affect this particular column of symptoms or columns of symptoms as well. There's a definite strategy towards what we do and what effect that has in, in allowing people to feel more empowered. So of the 10 criteria that we outlined in the presentation, firstly, the model actually has to be safe. Whilst we can actually generate um, uh, improvements in people as well, there needs to be a sense of, if improvement is not taking place, can we actually turn that around by making further suggestions, or can we actually reverse symptoms that might actually have been um, unhelpful or unwarranted, and can we reverse those simply because we've been able to track those symptoms in a very timely fashion on a daily basis in a graded 10-point scale, which allows a lot of sensitivity. And so now what we want to do is demonstrate both safe and effective protocols that are logical and they're easy to understand. And if they're easy to understand, then you'll get more cooperation from a patient and then you'll be able to implement those logical strategies um, in a way which boosts the chances of recovery and success. They have to be empowering and practical self-help strategies. It's not something that you can rely on at a particular centre because they have that piece of equipment and only that piece of equipment will help. Now it has to be far more accessible than that and it actually has to allow people to um, perform these self-help strategies anywhere at any time and um, with a minimum of fuss. So the strategies themselves need to be something that doesn't require equipment or medication or um, expert um, guidance and supervision because the strategies themselves actually have to come from yourself and or from the patient. Now, um, as we've said, um, there needs to be um, access to recording measures and that's why having an online recording system is very good uh, because we're able to now incorporate that the, um, that the recording of such information um, is necessary because it removes any um, uh, suspicion of doubt or any factual uh, recalling of information which may be incorrect. So we want to be able to record the information in a timely fashion on a daily basis, which doesn't take too much time, but up to five minutes to be able to record all of the symptoms of the day um, so that we can rely on the accuracy of those symptoms because our confidence is dependent upon them. Patient-centered care also has to provide a broader perspective. It actually has to show a trend as we go through. So it actually has to be um, timelined and date stamped so that we can actually see well, what's actually occurring over a period of time. It's not actually good enough to be able to look at one particular symptom and say, oh yes, that's going really well, but in the context of that trend show that there's been no improvement whatsoever. And the flip side of that is also true. Even if we have a bad day, it doesn't matter if it's um, covered 
in um, a multitude of very good findings as well, before and after. So contextualizing flare-ups or crashes um, has to be done because we're not looking at a static event, we're looking at a dynamic uh, move towards recovery, a healing that's taking place. Now, the particular centered healthcare also has to be values driven. There actually has to be something very meaningful for clients to be able to say, wow, this is the first time ever, or for as long as I can remember, I've never been able to do this. And we've been able to do this within three weeks of starting care. That's phenomenal. Um, so there has to be something that really speaks into a person's ability to be impressed and achieve a meaningful moment, which gives them a sense of hope. It's no point going on with this particular system if light or hope cannot be generated and there's no actual destination that can actually be seen for months and months and months. Because some people are told that, well, in order for this medication to work, it's going to take at least three to six months for the medication to have an effect. That's not necessarily something that's actually patient-centred. That might be more pharmaceutically-centred and... Um, you'll have to excuse the suspicion there, but uh, three to six months of sales is being generated before something is actually taking place, and it's a legitimate um, a reason for concern because if it's possible to be able to generate something within three to six weeks, well then I would prefer for my patients to be able to have something that occurs sooner rather than much, much later and eventually may shown to be have no effect whatsoever. So we do need that sense of accountability and that sense of speaking into a person's meaningful moments or their goals. It actually has to be um, customer driven. Um, the seventh aspect of patient-centered healthcare is that um, there has to be a movement away from the practitioner and to the patient. There has to be a sense of autonomy in that the person receiving the care has to feel as though they're actually no longer necessarily being dependent on another person to be able to grow in uh, what should be an autonomous um, uh, sense of health care. Uh, creating, creating dependency in a system um, may actually be self-serving and we don't want that to be a part of the patient-centred health care model. Patients are more than welcome to be able to continue to liaise with their practitioners, not necessarily because they need to now, but because they want to. And there's a big difference between being dependent and interdependent on um, a health practitioner. The eighth uh, uh, essential item or essential criteria for delivering patient-centered health care um, in, must mean that we are actually including other practitioners as well. It's not a one-stop shop, uh, but it basically collaborates with other healthcare workers and um, researchers as well. So we do want this information to be able uh, to be pooled in such a way which collaborates with other um, researchers or clinicians so that they can actually look at the particular data that's being shared through the Excel spreadsheet model and um, this particular model will actually allow for replication and also for the model to be leveraged and used in wider studies called community studies. So that sense of collaboration and fostering knowledge is able to be done in a patient-centred healthcare model that documents its symptoms in a timeline manner which can then be accessed, accessed and shared with other professionals. It's a very important part of being patient-centred because it adds to credibility and also the truth will be told across a wider cohort of people being examined. Um, the ninth particular criteria um, talks about uh, time-saving um, intake questionnaires and creating pre-populated Excel uh, templates as well. So um, practitioners themselves are going to find that the amount of time that's spent with the person here could be considerable. And so if we're able to generate Excel spreadsheets as well that can be pre-populated from um, an intake 
a um, confidential patient questionnaire intake which then automatically generates the Excel spreadsheet for recording results, then this is a very um, sensible way at allowing multiple practitioners who need to spend time with their patients but not as much time as was originally done um, in the early stages of developing this patient-centered healthcare model. So taking into consideration the amount of time that practitioners need to spend with patients um, can make it very difficult for multiple patients to be seen um, simply because of there's only a certain number of hours in a day. So if we can actually take those uh, intake questionnaires to generate a, um, a, an Excel spreadsheet which records um, the efficacy of treatment, that's a very useful aspect of being patient-centered. We don't want to actually take up patients' time as well only when necessary to be able to get to the root cause of what's causing the unexplained illness. The last aspect of patient-centered healthcare is that it actually has to follow a decreasing um, a cost um, as time unfolds. So it actually has to be cost-effective uh, with a decreasing cost scale due to the permanency of the results. So once a person is starting to see that they are feeling more and more in control, there's less um, need to visit a practitioner, um, the long-standing nature of the results automatically gives a sense of cost-effectiveness um, to the patient or customer. And it, when multiplied across hundreds of thousands of people, can actually significantly impact the burden attributed to society as well as it foots the cost of a growing um, healthcare spiralling um, um, cost structure which is uh, often crippling uh, nations as well because of increasing costs. So they're the 10 patient-centred healthcare cri criteria that were shared at the conference and um, we got so far as uh, that use it at the conference as well and now I'd not like to just include a little bit more about who are the likely responders to this particular model of care and I've put them um, in a quadrant type fashion whereas quadrant one, quadrant two, then three, then quadrant four uh, would uh, be able to compartmentalize who are the people that are most likely to respond and if we take a look at the biosystems approach, um, then we'll be able to then see that those people that have um, known habits, this is the way they do things, who are not taking medications, are most likely to respond. Uh, those people that have uh, multiple habits, uh, they do this, they do that, they have no particular preference for how they do things, who are also not taking medications, are probably likely to respond second fastest. And that's actually closely followed by those people who have known habits but who are on medications and who are willing to actually consult with their medicating practitioner to come off their medications in the face of, and we have to stipulate that it has to be in the face of symptomatic improvements as demonstrated by the biomarker Excel spreadsheet. And if we actually can see that um, there are symptomatic improvements, very dramatic ones, then a reduction in medication can actually be very useful because of the adverse reactions to particular medications. And here I want to highlight the importance of what it means uh, to be un uh, taking antidepressants and how some of those antidepressant medications themselves can actually be contraindicated in people with chronic fatigue, ME, simply because the medications themselves are creating symptoms where... Uh, those symptoms themselves are fairly constant. Um, they will not respond to anything else but a withdrawal of those symptoms. So people who are actually on some of these medications and they are experiencing constancy of the symptoms need to be speaking to the medicating practitioner in order to undertake this particular type of care. And the last uh, type of responders that we would uh, see uh, would be those people who have unknown habits who are also on medications themselves and are experiencing uh, dramatic side effects from the, the medications. In order to be able to make breakthrough in this particular group, and it's not impossible, but it just takes longer, 
um, is that uh, where people feel as though they cannot come off the medication for fear of things getting even worse, and yet the medication themselves is creating a problem um, with um, dramatic and sustained symptom um, symptoms, uh, there's going to be some sort of reluctance, delay in being able to work through an impasse there to be able to generate uh, results. So, um, to conclude here, and, and to be able to honour those listeners here that would like to be able to uh, see changes um, in, their, um, in their symptoms, whether that be for months or years or decades, uh, that's not the point. The point here is to the guide, um, uh, to the speed of response is going to be determined by how willing you are to be able to make change, how willing you are to be able to delete certain errors that you perform through certain habits that you're, you're performing themselves and how those habits themselves affect the physiology of the body. And so what I did um, was unable to, due to time restraint, restraints in the conference, was actually talk about the neurological involvement of the central nervous system and how it's actually um, in relationship with the spinal column itself. And there are certain areas within the spinal column that interrelate with the spinal cord, which is the structure that the spinal column houses, which actually controls the autonomic nervous system response or houses the autonomic nervous system responses and how certain behaviours from our spinal column actually influence certain neurological functions and or vascular functions within the spinal cord. So I I next had a slide that was not shown here that talked about um, vertebral artery flow to the... um, vertebral artery blood flow to the brain and how it itself is compromised and how um, a vertebral artery blood flow itself is a function of head rotation and also how um, it actually forms the posterior third of the blood flow going through to the brain. So whilst that's not able to be uh, described in a um, uh, the written format or uh, via audio, I thought it was important to be able to mention here that there are neurological embarrassments occurring via the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous systems which are creating this dysautonomia and responsible for panic, sweating, nightmares, night terrors, interrupted sleep, gastric motility problems, menstrual irregularity, immune dysfunction and the list goes on. So um, how we can actually integrate the whole systems model in, um, in an approach to be empowering people is extremely important towards changing all of these things because as time passes, the symptoms don't necessarily get better. And as each decade passes, it's like the chapter in a book being unfolding, whereas the symptoms get worse and there may actually be dysplasia or there may actually be some sort of precancerous or um, need for radical intervention because there's embarrassing amounts of blood flow being lost during menstrual time, I can't tolerate this anymore, I need a partial hysterectomy or I may need a full hysterectomy or I may need particular operations to remove my gallbladder or correct my um, airway passages because I can no longer breathe fully and I'm having apneic episodes as well. So whilst we can't say that this particular treatment um, is a cure for any of those things as well, what we can say is that people that have had those symptoms and those conditions have actually improved when they no longer require CPAP, they have had a regulated normal menstrual cycle that has occurred for more than 11 cycles um, in a row, Um, their ability to play piano Um, uh, without being suffering from panic attacks or sit um, in the front seat of a car uh, with the driver uh, and no longer experiencing extreme panic or mood disorders. Um, All of those things have happened and um, we can replicate those things uh, by the hundredfold. So it was a wonderful opportunity and again I want to take the um, give thanks to those organisers Uh, from Griffith University who allowed me to be able to present quite a provocative and alternative approach uh, to regulating um, healthcare 
in a very timely fashion, and I want to thank them for their courage in being able to welcome all possible avenues towards helping uh, patients themselves have a life that's not just returned to normal, but living a life that is beyond normal, where they're chasing their dreams. So I hope this was of some benefit to you. Thank you. So this is Dr. Daniel Dada from St. Jude's Clinic in Sydney, wishing you every success in your attempts to be able to uh, reclaim the life and pursue um, the goals uh, that you had uh, to, um, to share with your family and friends. Goodbye for now.